Welcome to Brand Nevat. We are delighted to be joined by Alex Guerrero, and we're going to be talking about his latest book called Lotocracy. Um, Alex, would you like to start with a thought experiment? So imagine you know, you're flying on a plane, and maybe there's, I don't know, 50 people on the plane, and the plane crashes on an island. And so you're on this island now with these 50 people, and remarkably, nobody's killed. Uh, but 40 people of the 50 are significantly injured. Uh, there's some children, and many of them aren't really able to kind of make their way. Um, you don't have any immediate way of helping them medically, but let's say for the example that they're relatively stable, um, but there's 10 of you who are unhurt and you're doing fine. Now, once you're in this position of being unhurt, you might think very naturally you have a kind of moral obligation to try to help and try to figure out not just what would be good for you given this kind of disastrous situation, but to think about what would be good for everyone. Uh, you might consider talking to everybody about it and say, okay, so what are we going to do? Uh, some immediate, you know, things to think about. How are we going to get water? Do we need to find better shelter? How are we going to get food? How are we going to connect to the outside world? Uh, all these things are going to be sort of pressing. You might try to figure out, you know, is there telecommunication still possible from the flight? Um, and so let's imagine in this case that the 10 of you, none of you are officials with the plane, none of you are the pilot. Um, and you now sort of talk to the whole group and you might think, you know, you get some information about what they think you ought to do. Somebody says, okay, we definitely need to go look for water. And so you, as the 10 who can move about decide, okay, some of us are going to go look for water. Somebody else says, look, I think in the distance, you can see a radio tower or something like that. Others say, okay, we're going to head off toward the radio tower. Right? So in the process of doing this, the 10 people are coming to have various kinds of obligations. They owe something to the group as a whole, you might think. I think it's plausible that as they move away, say as they get closer to the interior of the island, if they've landed on the beach and they're looking around and they're seeing possible sources of fresh water, they're thinking about where they might find water. Or as the people move toward the radio tower, they might get more information. Oh, actually it looks like it's closed up and won't actually work. One thing that might happen is these 10 individuals might start to get some kind of epistemic separation from the rest of the group. Uh, so they might still really, though, need to think about the interests of the group. And some of them might feel like, okay, we should go back and check in with the other people on, still on the beach by the plane. And we might think this is an important part of our responsibility now. Right. So this is a kind of thought experiment. One thing it does is it highlights sometimes we can be thrown together with a bunch of people and all of a sudden have obligations to them. And it might be that some of us are singled out in various ways to all of a sudden have distinctive kind of obligations to look out for their interests, to think about what other, would be good for other people and what they need. And so you might think in this example, it's not that the 40 have chosen or in other ways elected these 10, it's more happenstance than that. And it's also not that the 10 have promised or made other kinds of ethical commitments to these 40. It's something more about just being thrown together in various circumstances. And there are sort of practical instrumental reasons for these 10 to take on this role. So one of the things we might ask, you know, kind of question are, are there yeah, distinctive obligations? What do they look like? What are the norms that should govern how the 10 act now in response to the rest? Uh, do we have distinctive obligations? Let's say you're the only Spanish speaker and some of the people on the plane speak Spanish. Plausibly, you now have kind of distinctive obligations as one of the 10 who speak Spanish to figure out what their needs are in particular and make sure that they aren't being left behind. And again, that's not because you were chosen. It's not because you were selected. So I think this kind of thought experiment, you know, we can imagine ourselves uh, somewhat thrown together with all the people of the world where we have to figure out how to survive, what's going to be needed. And I think there'll be cases in which some of us are differently located in terms of what we're able to do. And as a result, we might need to think about our obligations to others. Yeah, I like that thought experiment a lot. And it raises, I guess, two distinct questions for me. Um, so one is whether there seems to be, at least with respect to the thought experiment, something suboptimal about the fact that they're thrown together. 
maybe it'd be better if there were a larger group of people and they could make the case for their different specialties and then vote on that. I wonder if that would be, even though it's not an option in the thought experiment, if that would be comparably better, were that an option? But the other thing is, this is, so to map on, I take it to the role of political institutions. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about the purposes of political institutions and the failure conditions that you go over in the first part of your book that might help us map this on to autocracy. Yeah, great. So, I mean, I think one of the the things you suggest is, would it be good to have all of us vote? You know, would it would that be better if all 50 people, say, could participate? Now, one thing I'll just note is that it's true that even with this situation, all 50 people, at least, uh, you know, we can specify that detail, are capable of voting. You could ask them questions. Uh, one of the suppositions of the thought experiment is that not all 50 are equally able to go around and actually do stuff, spend their time and energy doing these things. And that's a place where I, you know, hope the thought experiment maps on pretty well to our actual use of political representatives, where there's a kind of acknowledgement on some level it might be good if all of us had infinite time and energy uh, to actually spend the time to work through all the political decisions and to think about, you know, all that needed to be done. Uh, but we also acknowledge in the modern world, most of us live in huge political communities. The problems that we're trying to wrestle with are very vast and complex, partly as a result of the size and scale of the political community. And so we're going to need to use representatives and there's going to be a limit to how much the rest of us can actually learn about these issues and how much time we can spend actually working on them. So you know, to carry it over to the political case a little bit. So one of the things I worry about and talk about at length is the way in which electoral democracy is supposed to work by all of us together having an informed view about what ought to be done and monitoring in a detailed way what our potential, you know, representatives are doing. So first as candidates and then after they've been elected. And the worry, the failure conditions as I talk about them in the book really that, you know, as the size and scale of the political community grows, as the problems become more complex and more intricate, it's just hard for any one of us to have a very informed view about them without an informed view about the, the policy questions and, you know, plausibly also without an informed view about what our representative is trying to do with respect to those policy matters. It's going to be very hard for us to hold them meaningfully accountable. And so I think what you actually see is because of this complexity and the kind of difficulty of knowing everything that we need to, to actually hold our representatives accountable, special interests and others can come in and effectively capture the elected officials or the people running for office. So I think that's one big central problem in the background in the modern world is we have these, you know, as I see it, political institutions whose job it is to help us solve various problems that we face together. So complex things, things that we need to work together to solve, things like climate change, questions of international trade, questions of providing, you know, a healthcare system that works for everyone, uh, questions of, you know, criminal justice systems, mass education, all of these things are large and intricate and complicated. And so we're going to need some system that's going to work on that level. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's a hard question of, you know, what we might do given that situation. So Jürgen Habermas has this idea of a deliberative democracy where you have different kinds of deliberation at different levels of society. So you can imagine, you know, citizens kind of getting together on their own in coffee shops and deliberating about various ideas. You know, those things can grow into social movements where people start protesting. They might form into big community organizations. Uh, the press might start covering it. Um, they might posit various solutions to some of these problems. And then these things filter into elected representatives. We then will have high level discussions about the details. They might drop legislation. Um, they might be able to have small groups that specialize in a particular area. They can produce that legislation. You then have further deliberation from, you know, a litigation process where people try and iron out the concerns they have. So again, the citizens get involved in litigating, you know, the judges might strike down certain aspects of the law. And then this kind of just continues ad infinitum. And so there you also have the ability to hold your representatives to account in a democratic process. So, you know, if it is the case that the party that you picked to champion your interests doesn't, 
you say, well, I'm going to vote for the other party uh, and I'm going to make sure that those guys don't have access to power. And that seems like a way of holding people to account. I think you're right to point out that, you know, special interest groups can play an enormous role in getting uh, what they want done um, because it's quite hard for citizens to know about all issues. But maybe that's okay. Maybe what happens is that you have a variety of different lobby groups uh, who are participating in the deliberation. So some people, uh, you know, will make a strong argument for why uh, you should allow people to smoke wherever they want. So the tobacco guys are kind of funding those lobby groups and other people will push the, the health uh, dangers of tobacco and you'll have citizen groups that fight that. And so you'll have this deliberative process, even if it's fueled by money. Um, and that might be okay, that you're going to kind of wind up with a, an outcome that's legitimate because people have participated. The lotto version of that, I suppose, is that you have a lot of this deliberation, but if I understand it, the representatives are not selected by us, but selected at random. And then, you know, we'll get an opportunity to interface with experts. Why do you think that that system is going to be a better system uh, than the one that we have? Yeah, I mean, a few things. So it's it's uh, nice in the description, the kind of electoral story, where there's a kind of bubbling up of um, you know, political participation and like meaningful, thoughtful deliberation on the issues. And that crystallizes into political party platforms and eventually gives us a range of options. And then we can sort of pick those options, try them out, see how they work for us. And if we don't like them, we can switch. Um, that's the ideal, right? That's in a way that's, um, if it worked that way, that would be just fine, I think. And in a you know, real sense, this is a much better system than most of what has ever been tried throughout human history. So especially for governing a large polity. So it's very different, you know, than a kind of small scale town hall, community village kind of, um, you know, political context, as soon as you get that kind of size and scale going to be real difficulties. So my fear, a few different ones really about this story. Uh, one is that at least in places like the United States, where you have a first past the post voting system. So, you know, we're electing one person to represent a district and the person with the most votes wins. So, um, there's a, you know, a claim in political science that, you know, according to Duverger's law in systems like that, you're going to get two dominant political parties, third parties, fourth parties, uh, won't be viable. So that's different than say in a proportional representation system there, you might have four or five viable parties, uh, but in a two party only system, I think the options are quite limited. There's a real worry about collusion on certain issues. So they effectively get left to the shadows rather than being the kind of thing that we spend a lot of time deliberating or talking about. I worry also that the media, if controlled by corporate interests of various kinds, can focus our attention on certain issues and not on others, and can also persuade us and give us views about those issues. So that'll also, you know, rather than being a bubbling up, nice thing, organic from the ground, taking our real interests into account, there's a worry about manipulation and distortion that's going to come into the process because of the way in which um, you know, corporate controlled media might structure our attention our, and our engagement. Um, I also think that elections pit us against each other in this us versus them kind of way. And that itself can become a kind of vicious spiral where rather than working together to solve our problems, we start to see ourselves as in groups and out groups and the kind of natural human tendency to vilify and distrust the out group members. I think really has shown itself in a lot of electoral context. So it really makes it hard for us to work together and makes it hard for us to really do things in the way that we'd like. Now, there's a lot of empirical support for what I've just said, that things are working more or less as I've described it in this non-ideal way. Uh, one of the main things that, you know, political scientists also point out is that the way we vote isn't about this kind of rational consideration of what's happened to us over the last two or four or six years under this administration, under this government, it's much more of a kind of chaotic lashing out in response to all kinds of factors, many of which are clearly not the you know responsibility of the, the politicians. So for a variety of those reasons, I think, although the ideal might sound good, I don't think they work so well in practice. Um, so I think the, vi the vision that I have is um, of using random selection to choose political representatives. Now, people have talked about that 
in a system where you'd have, say, a bicameral legislature with an elected branch and a randomly chosen you know, branch, and they might have to then work together. Now, I'm worried that elections introduce a lot of distortion and misinformation and problems that would continue to be present if we had a sort of bicameral legislature. So I try to defend a system on which we'd have, instead of a generalist legislature, bicameral or not, we'd have a network of 20 different single issue legislative bodies, each of those populated by people chosen at random. And, you know, so let's say there was one on energy, another on education, another on agriculture. Uh, so there'd be single issue legislative bodies. The randomly chosen citizens wouldn't necessarily know anything about those topics coming in. And so part of the process would be building uh, what I call a learning phase where you would have experts and advocates and stakeholders come in and present all kinds of different ideas about what might be done in that policy space. There'd then be extended kind of internal deliberation, but also external engagement with the community, kind of engaging in community consultation, seeing what other people outside think, and this kind of extended back and forth. And eventually these randomly chosen citizens would have the power to directly enact legislation. So. One of the attractive things about it is this kind of selection gets a genuine microcosm of the political community. So all the different views and values and preferences that are in the community would be present and reflected in the randomly chosen group. That's really different than what we get with elections, which really skews toward an elite, you know, far wealthier, dramatically more male, at least in the United States, many more, you know, high percentage, 50%, 60% have backgrounds as lawyers or business people. So we get a real skew in who's actually, you know, in political power. And I think one of the nice things about lottery is we avoid that entirely. I think also it allowed people to focus rather than on campaigning or on the issues that divide us, it allowed people instead to focus on places where we might already agree. There might be good ideas available for us to address some political problem. And this is something that can happen, you know, relatively straightforwardly and organically. Um, I also think elections encourage a kind of short-term thinking and give us a kind of mistaken impression about the actual political problems we're facing and their urgency and autocratic institutions also would avoid that. So getting people to come together and really hear about, well, what are the big issues? What are the problems we're facing and what are some attractive ideas uh, that we might implement? Yeah, that's all very helpful. And there's a lot of information there. And in spite of that, I still think it'll be helpful to dig a little bit more into the weeds. So I'm wondering, are you envisioning this at every level of government, like state, local, federal? Can you speak a little more to like how large the groups would be? You talk about them breaking out into uh, smaller subgroups to deliberate about issues and having experts come in and experts at leading discussion sort of facilitate that deliberation. So I think it'd be worth maybe going into a little bit of those details and then um, talking about potential objections. So one, you know, on one version of it, yes, they would be everywhere. These kinds of institutions, we'd have them, you know, at the federal level, but also at the state or province level. We'd have them at the county level, municipal level, you know, at every level. Um, that's, you know, on one version. Now they might be a little different in the details, right? So what policy areas would be relevant? Uh, which, you know, single issues they would need to focus on might differ. Um, they might, you know, be networked in complex ways at these different levels, just as in most electoral democracies, it's often, you know, a whole semester of law school to understand how the federal and state governments interact and which has power over what. And so you'd have some of those same questions. Um, but as, you know, for the size of them, so I think, you know, in one model, say thinking about the federal government anyway, so you'd have, I don't know, 20 of these different single issue legislative bodies. I call them SILs, uh, just for short, um, with a total of 450 people, 150 people cycling through each year, serving three-year terms. Uh, I suggest not having people be forced to serve but instead giving them a considerable incentive, you know, financial incentive and lots of job security and other protections so that we'd really encourage people to serve. And, but that'd be an important thing to observe whether there was a lot of skew in terms of who shows up. Um, and then they would take part, you know, in this three year um, process, but along the way, there'd be lots of other places where people would be involved and engaged. So, or other non-selected citizens who weren't 
part of any one of these bodies would have a chance to kind of petition and create um, support behind ideas to be put on the agenda for them to consider. Uh, they'd be able to come in as experts and stakeholders and advocates. Um, there'd be a kind of background structure to all of this, and that would be overseen by what I call uh, structural assemblies, where these would be responsible for thinking about like the expert selection process or the rules around deliberation or the details of how that deliberation should happen. And so, right, these randomly chosen citizens would come together. They'd often break up into smaller groups where there'd be discussions facilitated by, you know, relatively, you know, non-expert people who are trained in discussion facilitation. And, you know, all of that complexity uh, would have to be kind of overseen and regulated over time. And there's a ton of choice points. So I think a lot of interesting questions to ask about whether and how to have deliberation, how to structure it to avoid some people dominating, how to make sure you get broad, you know, based political engagement and participation, how to make sure that people aren't being bought off or corrupted by outside influences. So I've got a couple of thoughts about how things could spiral out of control. The one is you envisage three years, um, and that might be too short. So if you think about a lot of people in the American Senate, you know, they've been there for decades. So you've become a specialist in the art of politics. You know, you understand law because you've played a role in drafting, not just in one area, but in a variety of areas. You also understand that issues are interconnected. Um, you also realize that there's only so much money that could be spent, um, given what the budget looks like. And so, you know, if you're, if you siphon everybody up, into their different 20 areas, everyone might say, well, you must prioritize my thing. Whereas if you have, you know, a legislature who's a generalist, they might realize, well, if we spend all the money on healthcare, there'll be no money for education. So, you know, those interests are taken into account. And it might be that what you have as well is uh, chaotic influences. So you could have people who, let's say, for the last two years have been deliberating very carefully and have spent the time thinking about the issues and the new batch of people come in and you have some complete megalomaniacs chosen by random who destabilize the whole process. I wonder if you think that there should be restrictions on who gets to participate in the lotto. So as you mentioned, it, it currently is the case that there's a, a process that business people and lawyers who've gained either practical experience in running an economy um, or an enormous amount of theoretical experience and some practical experience in the nature of law uh, who are currently represented. So you might think that they are quasi experts in general, uh, maybe not in specific areas, but that they understand these mechanisms. And we also might think that given the people that we spend time with, you know, if you're an academic, you say the people around me seem pretty smart. If I roll the dice, I reckon one of these people would be great at running the country. But if you rolled the dice in uh, your country broadly, um, would you be that comfortable? Um, would you think that you know, uh, and any citizen picked by random would be as good as any other. Um, you know, in South Africa, we have a huge range um, in terms of, you know, intellectual capacity, in terms of, um, you know, temperament, virtue, all sorts of things. Um, and I think I'd be comfortable rolling the dice in some areas of my society, but not in others. Um, and I might think that, you know, a couple of badly chosen apples uh, could rot the entire system. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a bunch of different worries that you raise, all very reasonable. So um, just on the last, uh, some, you know, I talk about under the heading of competence and concerns about, you know, competence. Now, there's um, one dimension to it. You mentioned intellectual capacity, or we might call it like native intelligence or something like that. My own view is I, I have no fears on that front. Like I think, yeah, of course, there's quite a lot of variation across the, the population. I think we also see that same thing in elected officials, right? Some of them have been serious, accomplished, you know, students, high achieving, others are just very well connected and wealthy and been handed everything to them. And there's a mix of these things. And I think it's very hard to say what kind of intelligence actually is required to be an effective you know, person in these kinds of institutions. So I don't think being able to solve very complex mathematical you know, problems or do philosophy at a very high level. I mean, those aren't going to be the relevant kind of skills needed. And so I have a lot of confidence that you know, anybody could do this, right? So I, I went to Harvard as an undergrad. Um, I went to a very you know mediocre public high school. 
Uh, not bad, just not great. A lot of students didn't even go on to college or whatever. And I would say easily the top third of my high school class could be swapped in for the bottom fifth of my first year, you know, my class at Harvard, nobody would notice, right? And I think the way in which people get into these elite institutions has very little to do with any of this kind of innate ability or any of that. There's so much more about connections and resources and support and access and things like that. Um, and I think, you know, in many cases, it's not even that they end up having more because of all this like training or something like that. Uh, I think there is just a lot of luck of this other kind in our society. So at least that's what I would say uh, about the American case. And I imagine it's like that in many other places, particularly places that have more of a commitment to an egalitarian, high quality public education. And so that's on the kind of general competence worry. Um, then there's this other worry that, well, with randomly chosen people, they won't know very much about politics. They won't necessarily know how to be a good politician in terms of working on compromise and coming together and legislative drafting. Um, they also just might not have enough of a sense of what their role should be, how they should make their decisions. Um, one doesn't have to stay entirely in the armchair on this. There have been, you know, something like, you know, 2000 citizens assemblies used around the world for various things where people have been randomly chosen to come together and talk about whether say, you know, we should invest more in wind power in our community or whether we should build a nuclear reactor here or there, uh, or much broader questions like, should we allow same sex marriage under the constitution? And people have been brought together coming with very different backgrounds and levels of education. And, you know, to my mind, and also, you know, to those who have studied these bodies, uh, they've been quite impressed with the level of discussion the level of engagement certainly seems to compare favorably with what we get through kind of online yelling at people over Twitter or say watching the U S presidential debate and the kind of level of policy discussion and engagement we get there. So I'm sort of optimistic that actually we're more than up for this challenge. And there's something about the electoral process that's making us worse, making our best selves kind of retreat, making the people who want to do this job, be some of the people who want power over others. And I'm not sure that's a good reflection of the actual virtues and skills and epistemic humility and everything else that we, we might want in people who are coming together to try to, you know, work on and solve our political problems. So, you know, I think there's lots of issues in the details, right? So you, you just to talk about one of them, you know, the lottery is one thing, but the single issue legislative structure is another. And you talk about, well, what about if you got really excited about your thing? You wouldn't know very much about what's going on somewhere else. You might be overly invested in it. Um, a couple of thoughts there. One, I mean, with a generalist legislature, we see all this happen, but it's just behind closed doors and committees and subcommittees where particularly invested politicians from places where for various reasons they have an interest in some particular issue, they learn a lot about that issue, but they don't learn about everything. They don't have broad interests across all policy domains. They don't become fully generalist, you know, th you know political thinkers, uh, they're often highly focused on one or two things and, you know, advocate for those things very strenuously. Often, I think as a result of basically been having bought off by powerful special interests that tell them to, you know, take up these marching orders. And so, um, I'm skeptical that, you know, what we get now avoids that kind of worry. Um, I think there are hard questions about like drafting, you know, the actual policy and things like that. But you see all kinds of drafting and legislative aids now in elected legislatures. And those same people could play some role in the background. You know, obviously you worry about, you know, if they become too powerful in that role, but uh, the way these have worked in a lot of contexts, I think it, there's real ways to keep them relatively nonpartisan, rotate them through different jobs so that they don't get bought off themselves. And, you know, I think uh, there are institutional design responses to a lot of those kinds of worries. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether people who are barred from participating or would not participate in spite of the incentives that might be provided for them, um, would prevent the groups from being selected, um, from frequently being representative enough. Right. So besides that, barring people by age. There might be, I mean, maybe you want to bar people who, uh, are, are in prison, 
for violent crimes or people who have, have psychological issues like serious psychological issues that make them incapable of um, deliberating about these sorts of things. Uh, but also what sorts of people do you think would decline going? So, I mean, one might be um, those that are tied uh, to their home. And if it requires relocation for like a federal level, they might not want to do it for that reason. Um, might be people who are generally suspicious of government. It might be people who, even if they were legally protected from walking away for their job for three years, might not want to take that risk. So maybe they come from an area where there's a shortage. So I think there's a shortage of anesthesiologists right now. And they might reasonably think, well, if I leave and serve for three years, then, um, there's not going to be an extra anesthesiologist. There'll just be one fewer, and then they'll have to rely on, uh, people that have like two year degrees to serve as assistants. And that, that results in more deaths. So that's something I have to weigh when I make that decision. Um, or maybe small business owners or something like that, where they think they, even if their income stays the same, they couldn't find somebody to replace them that would, you know, protect their long term, term job prospects and so on. So anyway, that, I, I just raised a bunch of specific worries, but I guess the more general concern is, um, if we're allowing people to decline going and excluding some people from being, uh, um, eligible for this, does that raise worries about actually getting a representative group? So, I mean, one, one thing to say is, uh, there's always a comparative question here, right? In terms of what do we get with elections and is it worse along these dimensions? And, you know, my, uh, strong suspicion is that it would be hard to be worse. Like if you look at the kind of occupational background of Congress or something like that, you know, very few doctors, scientists, teachers, very few, uh, you know, people who've been unemployed, very few people who have spent time as a single parent or a uh, recent immigrant. So, you know, I think we get a real skew in who actually ends up serving in our elected institutions. And so, you know, it, it might be not perfect microcosm, but it still might be much better. Uh, but even so, I think, you know, part of the argument pressed for, you know, litocracy in my view is that it does get a more uh, egalitarian, genuine commitment to political equality. Everyone is really uh, eligible. Everyone is really, you know, capable. And so I think that's something I would worry about if you started to notice skew. Now, you know, a few things to say just as a practical matter. I think, you know, three years, that's one length of term. It could be shorter. It could be longer. There's pros and cons, right? So the longer they have, the more experience, the more, you know, kind of education about the issue, but also the more cost to individuals. And there might be a lot of contexts where, you know, three years isn't required. So. Uh, and even if three years is required in some sense, it needn't be like every minute of those three years. So say, I think in, uh, the United States, the state of Nebraska, the elected state legislature, I think only meets for like eight weeks a year or something like that. It's really doesn't need to be a kind of, you know, every waking moment kind of job. Uh, and it might well be possible to do a lot of it virtually. So there might be things where it's really important to come together, but they might also not require relocation. And so. It's really only the federal case with the kind of most extreme, like, would you really all have to travel to the nation's capital and relocate for three years that you start to see, well, maybe there's going to be harder questions there. Um, at the same time, I think it could really come to be seen as a, a big part of your civic duty really is to take part in these institutions. And it's a kind of wonderful opportunity. It's quite a role to play. And for the people who go through it, you know, the citizens assemblies, overwhelmingly people, it's like life changing and people come out genuinely uplifted and more positive about their world and the political community and our ability to work together. And so I think over time, as people saw this as like a really positive experience rather than something that's like a big hassle or a drag or something like that, I think that would also help get consistent, you know, levels of participation. Uh, obviously, you know, as you mentioned with the anesthesiologist, there might be particular instances where people should be allowed to defer, for example, maybe this isn't the right time, or maybe we need to have some accommodation made given the kind of work they do. So creating a different kind of schedule for them, allowing a different kind of, you know, possibly more remote than others participation. Um, and it might ultimately not be possible to get people from every kind of occupational category to do the work while also doing these jobs. 
Uh, but I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, we could look at and, you know, try to, uh, play with a little bit over time. Uh, and again, I think the comparative, you know, point is really, uh, it's going to, it would be very dramatic. The kinds of people who actually would get a role in politics, who've never had anything like a role in terms of exclusion. So in the, you know, in the book project, I really try to, you know, I already have taking on a lot of new controversial stuff. So I don't go anywhere radical with, uh, including all kinds of people who don't currently say have the right to vote. Um, I think that's an important kind of separate question, how or whether we should change who is kind of barred from political participation in various ways. So I think the U.S. Uh, in many places does a terrible thing by disenfranchising uh, people who, who've had a felony conviction even after they've been released. Uh, that seems like obviously unjustified. And it's very different than what other places do, many of which you know, focus on reentry and trying to get people to be rehabilitated, come back into society and join again as a, you know, citizen. Uh, and so I think that's a place where I would, you know, I would want to see real change, uh, as to whether people who are currently incarcerated should take part in the book. I actually say, maybe this might be the kind of thing we should think about accommodating, particularly in places like the U S where so much of incarceration is connected to things like policy choices around drugs and over criminalization of certain populations. And we might think these are, you know, deeply political issues and it's not obvious to me what justifies exclusion from the political process. So, um, that might also be a case, uh, as with people with significant disabilities, where we might think about using proxy representation as well. So there's a sense in which people can feel like they are held hostage by a political party that's in power. So in South Africa for the last 30 years, we've had single party dominance. So one party has had majority control uh, for three decades, and that just changed in our last election. They dipped below 40%. We have uh, proportional representation, so we actually have eight political parties who are in government at the moment and have to do deals with each other and compromise. But for a long time, a lot of people felt that it was hopeless to engage in democracy because there's nothing you can do to shift these guys out of power. They can pass whatever onerous um, you know, rules they want. They can be prejudicial to minority groups and treat them very badly. And, you know, you're a hostage. But there's a sense in which you could be a hostage in a, another way in a little autocracy. So if we really do have this broad pool of people who are picked and those people have been picked, the die have been cast, you say for the next three years, these are the people who are going to be running issues. Uh, you might, on the one hand, check out because you say, well, I have no role in it. I wasn't picked into the lotto. So those guys must get on with the task. And if they come up with really pernicious rules, well, that's what those rules are. Um, and it could be that they come up with them on their own, that you, you know, by random chance, you know, a couple of uh, megalomaniacs wind up in the pool and they're very good at convincing the others to do something maniacally sinister. Or that everybody's very easily influenced by the experts that get picked and a particular expert is really good at influencing them in a certain direction. And so the populace is now held hostage to the whims of either the technocrats um, or to the maniacs. Um, and there's no mechanism to do anything about it because, you know, if you realize we picked the wrong guys, we can vote them out. Here, well, we just have to hope that the dice next year churn up better options for us. There's another worry, which is, it seems like you've got a couple of different things that you're playing with. So you want to temper, you know, the, the lack of expertise from your populace by bringing in the experts. And you want some structure in place that's going to pick the issues. So those things seem to matter quite a lot, right? So the person who gets to set the agenda, who says these are the 20 different silos we're going to have, has an enormous amount of power in terms of what the issues of the day are. Uh, the experts that are selected, you know, it's very much the case that on any issue you can get two experts who will give you opposing opinions. Um, so who you pick makes a difference. In England, for example, um, with court experts, uh, you the, you have a, a range of experts and the court picks and says, you're acting for the defendant today, you're acting for the plaintiff. In South Africa, you know, each side gets to pick their own experts and then certain experts get a reputation for being, you know, good plaintiff experts or good defendant experts. Um, so I wonder how you pull those levers. Do you also think that the executive should be dealt with by lotter? I mean, would you be comfortable with, you know, the president being someone picked by lottery as opposed to, you know, let's say elected by the legislative autocracy? Um, you're hitting all the right kinds of questions. Uh, 
So the first one on that, we can't kick them out. Um, we could get stuck under some, you know, odd or maniacal group. Um, so that's, uh, it's certainly true that this is a way, you know, we're really committing to each other in, in the way that I guess nominally we think we do in a democracy where everyone can vote. Um, but you know, this could end up with some, you know, if you have a significant portion of the community with odd views on some topic, those will get represented. And so that's a thing that, you know, might happen over time. Uh, one thing I'll stress is that people only will serve three year terms at the you know federal level, you know, let's say. Uh, they might serve similar terms at other levels, but then they're out. You know, they're not going to continue in the way that elected officials do actually become almost invulnerable uh, in terms of incumbent advantages. It can very, you know, they can create gerrymanders to make it easier for them to be reelected. Uh, in the United States, you know, we're not supposed to be a one party state, but the New York Times just had a kind of detailed report about how down ballot races, you know, something like 59% of the seats are uncontested. So there's just a Republican or just a Democrat. So you don't really have any choice. Uh, often to the structure of the party, you have very little influence over the details of that. You get to pick, you know, left or right, but you don't really get to have much fine grained influence. Uh, and there might be a lot of policy questions where both sides are kind of lined up in the same place. Uh, so our, all of those are ways in which I think we currently now are expected to just put up with a lot of, you know, people in power over us. Uh, here, this really would be much more of a rotation through power with few people coming to have this distinct status over the rest of us. And depending on the size and the numbers, you know, we might start to also expect that, you know, you or someone you're close to or someone you work with or someone you have some influence and connection to might actually rotate through political power at some point. Most of us, you know, have no hope of that under these electoral systems, uh, unless you go to a certain kind of fancy school or you're self-connected in various ways. Um, so for all those reasons, I feel like it would actually feel much less like we're under the thumb of these people. Um, now the technocrats and the question about expertise, very important, right? So there's new citizens assemblies around the world. They bring experts in to talk to people. So in British Columbia, uh, they wanted to reform the voting system and the districting system. And so they had, you know, professors who knew a lot about voting systems come in and talk about a whole bunch of different options, explain what some of the pros and cons were. You know, these were professors who studied voting systems. Uh, we might ask, well, who is going to count as an expert? Who's going to get to speak to these groups? So yeah, I, there's an extended discussion of that in the book. Uh, partly because I think we should be really attentive to the way expertise is coming into our political life. I think with elections, we don't really notice the ways in which it is. I think it's largely in the form of special interests. They bring the expertise, they write up the draft of the policy, and then they influence people to pass it, but they're really the ones creating it. Uh, hardly an impartial group, you know, often they have a very clear interest in drafting things the way that they are. So as I envision it, we need to come up with a pretty elaborate system of trying to, as I think of it, develop a database of experts for different domains. The criteria of who counts as an expert would be different. Those that need to be kind of clear and you know, justified and often developed by the sub community of experts who know about that domain. And then having created that database of experts, the hope would be to pick them at random, to then be actually enabled to speak before the randomly chosen citizens. So there'd be an attempt in any way to like block the cherry picking or sort of very selective use of experts, even if that expert is really out of step with the broader expert community on this topic. So not that it would never happen, but that's the kind of, you know, mechanism that I think we would need. Um, and then, you know, same with agenda setting. So there's different ways we might go that. Uh, both dividing the issues into these 20 different silos and then within the silo, what things are we going to talk about? Um, so I think in both cases, there needs to be some process behind it. Uh, in, you know, the book, I talk about 20 different, uh, possible silos, uh, you know, as just one toy model, but it's really in that case, just drawing on what we see actual political communities doing in terms of the committees and subcommittees and administrative agencies they have and the kind of policy domains that they've focused on. But there's lots of different ways of dividing those up. And I envision one of the structural assemblies would have the job of 
both revisiting what are the particular silos and also in some cases considering merging or separating these single issue bodies so that they would either, you know, uh, work on uh, issues together, or in some cases, maybe too many things were falling into one bucket and we need to kind of d divide them up even further. So again, the need to be process, uh, the need to be institutional design and lots of interesting questions about how best to do it, uh, just on the executive. So I think the elected executive as it's done in the United States has been kind of an unmitigated disaster. Um, you know, and everyone who writes about the executive in the U.S. context, it's just about accumulation of power over time. More and more power has come under the thumb of the executive. We never wanted an elected king, but that's a lot like what we actually end up getting. Uh, the person has far too much power over almost every aspect of political life. Uh, that shouldn't be the model. We, you know, I think philosophers really need to rethink, like, what is the executive exactly? What is its distinct role? Uh, what's the sense in which it's executing or carrying out policy? Um, and then there's the other issues of like foreign diplomacy and the use of the military that we might think of as currently in most places under control of the executive. Uh, but we might, you know, also ask questions about why that's so, why isn't that seen as, you know, politics, policymaking. So in the book, I, you know, I acknowledge this is a whole book on its own, how to rethink the executive. But I do suggest moving away from elections and I consider, you know, the use of quite a few executive assemblies focusing on specific topics. Um, but the kind of details of that institutional design are complicated and, you know, you re would require in, in that case, I think, not just having randomly chosen citizens, but maybe, you know, two thirds randomly chosen citizens, one third people appointed because of their knowledge and experience in that particular area. That's helpful. I wanted to follow up on that with a specific worry about how to avoid people trying to influence um, people's judgment. So how, how to block elite capture in this case. Um, so like currently, if some special interest group wants favorable legislation, they can um, give to political lobbyists or to a think tank. They can donate to people running for office or fund campaigns um, who would pass legislation that's available to them. But then the people who get elected to office have to convince enough of their uh, potential voters to vote, vote them in. Um, but if the names of the people that were randomly selected to serve on these committees or to serve on the structural assembly were known, um, it seems much more cost efficient to try to get to those 450 people, even if you couldn't do it on the job, because they'll be exposed to experts that are, uh, let's suppose reliably selected. Um, it'd be easy to get to them on weekends and after hours or before on holidays and try to convince them of whatever you think is right. And that might be, might be very easy to buy 450 votes, maybe even easier than getting somebody into office who's going to put, put legislation up that's going to have to be voted on by other members to support what you want. Right. So I think important to distinguish like two different kinds of capture. One we might call like just corruption capture, where somebody's literally just giving them money to vote a certain way, or maybe giving them money to try to influence everybody to, you know, vote that way and then also to vote that way themselves. So I think for that, there'd be pretty straightforward mechanisms to police that and prevent it. So one is just paying the people quite well for doing this work, but then also conditioning that payment on them not taking other payment from outside. Uh, you could also require them to you know, be monitored while they were doing this work and after so that they weren't getting paid, you know, $100,000 every year for the next 20 years after they walk away. Um, so those kinds of things, you know, you, you could definitely put in place. We do that in the United States and pretty much everywhere, I'm sure, with juries, you know, often, you know, chosen to work on high profile cases, often with much more at stake financially and with only, you know, 12 people or so to actually require influence. And sometimes only one or two of them need to be bought off to get the result you want. So, you know, I think it's a hard question how to make sure that's happening and not every political community could pull it off, I think. There's quite a few places where 
there might already be too much background corruption. There might be too much distrust of the government and of the system so that people, you know, both wouldn't believe that the system wasn't corrupt and bought off in this way, nor, nor would it be true. Um, so I think, right, there's going to be some limits to that, but I think we also could pay people for turning in attempts to bribe them, right? So give people rewards. If this company comes up to you and says, vote this way, you can immediately take that and, you know, turn it over. They'll go to jail. You'll get a reward. You know, we can use carrots and sticks of various kinds, I think, to try to try to prevent that kind of naked corruption capture. So where is there's a workaround for that? So say I have like a um, a lobby that's trying to pre prevent legislation from coming in that would require us to be more environmentally responsible. And I say, oh, I, you know, I would never bribe you for your vote. You know that I run this pack, but I'm, I'm, I know you like the Simpsons. And what I want to do is give you $100,000 to come and like give a talk about what makes a classic Simpsons episode great. And now, because, you know, we're friendly and I'm giving you money, but I'm not giving you money to vote very explicitly, not giving you money to vote. I'm giving you money to do something that's apolitical. Um, you still can be influenced to kill legislation that uh, you know that I wouldn't like, just as a result of this personal and financial relationship we have. And if we tried to prevent that, by prohibiting compensation outside of politics. I don't know how, where you would draw the line to do that. And then it might disincentivize more people from taking that job because it, it would be too restrictive. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we already police these lines, right? So like, we don't allow just corruption and graft and things like that. Uh, we, we kind of do, but we're supposedly not doing that. And certainly things like paying people for giving a speech or something like that, getting them to write a book or whatever. All of these things, they are monitored, you know, and if you uh, were seen to be taking money from this entity, uh, that's the kind of thing that, yeah, you could be required to disclose. It's also the kind of thing you could be required to get permission to do. Uh, and in some cases, we might just forbid that you receive outside funds during this period of time without getting it sort of cleared in the right way. So I think, I still think that wouldn't be that wouldn't be how they would try to do it. That's my view. Partly, so another thing, this is just, you know, for one person on this large body. And what are you going to get by way of guarantee that they're actually going to vote this way or that? Um, I think it's not going to be a very effective mechanism unless you can get pretty tight policing. But I think it'd be hard to get the tight policing without courting a lot of attention and controversy, right? So um, I think my prediction is that's actually not going to be a very efficient way of doing things. And you're not getting somebody like, you know, Jesse Helms from North Carolina, who's going to stick up for the tobacco lobby for 40 years because he's going to never lose a seat in the Senate. Uh, these are people just there very briefly. Right. And uh, so my my prediction is that wouldn't be the efficient way to go. Uh, certainly it wouldn't be any easier than what we can do now. Right. So elected officials now we have to let them hear from lobbyists. We you know, can try to regulate lobbying more than we do, but we don't do it very well. In a lot of places, you can go from being an elected official to being a lobbyist and back. And, you know, that's rampant in political systems. We could do a lot more to police that. In fact, we, we don't do very well to police that. But um, so I, I think the comparatively speaking, the random rotation, paying them well, policing for that kind of corruption, um, and, you know, having laws against it would actually be quite effective. Um, the worry I have is more on the expert phase. Uh, however, you're going to get people to think about these issues and what views they'll come to have about them. Uh, cause I think that's a place where powerful entities could somewhat efficiently try to capture a whole sub community of experts or create a kind of pseudo expertise in some domain where they develop this rival theory that becomes well-funded and prolific enough. And it's pretty hard to, you know, discern from actual expertise. You know, a lot of the effective merchants of doubt sort of approach uh, for sowing, uh, you know, uncertainty about something. It can be very hard to show is, you know, somehow actually getting things wrong. It's often reasonable to raise some of these further questions. And so that's the place where I think powerful, the special interests would go to try to influence things. Um, perhaps that and the other place would be on the back end. Whatever is decided by these randomly chosen citizens 
if we've done a good job sort of screening them off in various ways and giving them a chance to really talk through this issue, they'll come up with an idea, they might enact it, but the broad public perception of that might still be somewhat up for grabs. And that would be a place where I think the corporate media sitting in the background might still try to have quite a lot of influence over what the rest of the community thinks, partly as a way of sort of destabilizing these bodies and whatever they're going to do. So um, that's just a kind of, I don't know, you know, in a massively inegalitarian society where, you know, 50 people control so much power and wealth, and they're so concerned to keep the political entities from really effectively regulating them, there's just going to be hard problems. We're never going to have an easy time avoiding capture entirely. So I want to give a case of a different kind of capture that you could have. So in academia, some people get tenure, right? And that gives them the opportunity to say things that run contrary to uh, other people's attitudes. So, you know, you can write about stuff that if you had to poll the populace, they would say, that's outrageous that you were doing research in that area. I really disagree with that. But there's nothing that someone can do to remove you unless you did something like very, very egregious. But if you're there for a short period of time and you then have to return to ordinary society, the social pressure that you might face for making certain decisions could be absolutely disastrous. So imagine that you are actually an angel, um, you know, that you, you've picked a bunch of really good hearted people who are trying their best, who are going to sit and deliberate and listen to the experts, and they come up with a decision. And then the Twitter mob goes apeshit on them and thinks you've betrayed us as the citizens. How dare you do this? You know, this is an outrage. As soon as you, you know, step off this body, we're going to make sure that your life is an, is an absolute misery. No one will ever hire you. How could you be complicit in this? So you think like, okay, well, I better backtrack from this. You know, I, I, I guess I've made a mistake because the mob is now after me. And that kind of organic cancel culture stuff we see happening all the time. But if you're in a political party, um, you know, you've got some level of defense against it. You know, there's other structures in place. You know, you're, I'm not subject to the Twitter mob. I'm subject to an actual electorate, you know, whereas you could create a real sense of fear and distort the kinds of decisions that people make, you know, if they're only there for a short period of time and then have to reintegrate. Um, so you could wind up with a, a, a very dangerous kind of mob rule by proxy, where basically those that are allowed on social media are able to puppeteer you know, the, the saintly, uh, lotocrats into coming up with all sorts of decisions. Um, and if you think about the way that people bubble up ideas on social media, often they're highly driven by emotion. They're not uh, driven by reason and the best evidence. You know, if you had to sort of pick how we should have dealt with many of the issues of the last 10 years, you know, putting Twitter would seem like the worst way to do it. Taking a random sampling would be like a terrible idea. And so you might be surrendering, uh, to that mob on your system. I also just think there's a general concern, which is that you're dissatisfied with how democracy goes and you accept that people aren't angels, that you can elect these demonic figures and that you want a whole range of constraints in place, which are currently there. And I just wonder if changing out the individuals makes a big difference. In other words, a lot of what you've said is, well, we have all these you know, ways of controlling people in a democracy. I'm not sure if you're shifting any of them. It's not like you've said, and this would give us extra control. Um, it seems like when you're designing a political system, you can either be very hopeful and think that human nature is wonderful, or you can think that human nature is a really dark, dangerous side to it, and you want to you know, diffuse power and make it quite hard for people to make decisions because they can affect other people's lives. Um, and so I wonder if you think you're, uh, if the risk ratio changes under your system. One thing I'd say uh, about the mob ruling sort of indirectly or something like that, I think it is true the randomly chosen people would think about how will this be received, right? Now, there's a lot of issues where I don't think ordinary people have very many views about them at all, right? Like exactly what, you know, price this particular thing should be set at or should we regulate this? Should Medicaid cover this or that exactly? You know, I think there's a lot of nitty gritty decisions that ordinary citizens have almost no views about at all, right? So that's what we learned from a lot of empirical political science. And so I think for a lot of the work that the randomly chosen citizens would be doing, they'd be sifting through stuff kind of for the first time. It wouldn't be very high profile. One of the things I like about the system is that it allows to focus on issues where there's good ideas, there's things that need to be done, uh, but they're not 
places where we're highly divided. So elections really encourage us to focus on the things that most divide us, that we feel you know, most angry with the other side so that we'll be animated to go out and actually vote. Uh, but you might think that's a terrible way to actually find all the things that we should be doing and working on together. And so I guess it seems to me the rare case that you'd get some big social media firestorm about what the randomly chosen people had decided to do. I think often what they decided would be pretty reasonable and sensible and would seem that way to other people because indeed they were just like them. You know, they aren't some distinct skew of the population. They've learned some more about the issue, kind of like the people, you know, the 10 wandering away from the rest of the people of the plane crash, you know, so they now have some more information, but they can share that information with the people, you know, right? So it's not as if having learned, oh, this is why I think we should do this in this policy domain, it remains forever closed. Indeed, I think one of the things I like about the system is that it allows expertise to be filtered through ordinary people and their views and values in a way that they can then communicate. Well, why did you do this? Why did you think this was the way to go? Well, here, you know, this is the stuff that moved me and they can communicate that, you know, by hypothesis, they won't be experts themselves. And, you know, they'll be able to talk to the broader community about this. And I expect that kind of interplay over time. Uh, some of it will be structured, you know, so there's back and forth with the community, even while they're making their decision about what to do. So it's not like they're just going to go in a black box and announce some dramatic change two years later or something. Um, so I, I guess I don't see too much of a worry on that front. I also think the viciousness of our social media life is partly a function of the electoral stuff sitting in the background and the way in which many of us feel like existential threats are facing us at every turn and half of us are trying to destroy the things we care most about and the other half think exactly the reverse and i feel like it's very hard to live like that so this is a place where i would hope over time we might actually rebuild some sense of community and kindness and not that i'm overly optimistic about humans in general i just think we're very subject to the pressures that were put under by the institutions that we live within so um, yeah, my thought is something like um, elections introduce a lot of incentives that we maybe shouldn't welcome. So one is it brings power to people who want it most. The people who want to have power over others have avenues to seek it. Not everyone wants power for bad reasons, I don't think, but I do worry that it creates a real skew. Uh, so Chesterton has this nice you know, phrase that, you know, democracies an effort to bring the shy people out. I think, in fact, we don't see that very profoundly in our electoral democracies. A lot of people have views, but they're, they don't want to jump into the fray. They don't want to necessarily have this role of, uh, you know, being empowered over others. And so I think we might get a kind of skew in terms of who actually shows up and what their personalities are like and what their values are like. Um, so that's one thing to say. Another is, you know, I think we have had to learn quite a lot about what protections, what fences are needed, even, you know, to keep the political structure working decently well. And I'd imagine, you know, if we had a lotocratic system, we'd need to, we'd encounter new problems, right? Things we hadn't thought about, just as the founders of the U.S. had no inkling of the role political parties would come to play. And now political parties are like front and center in our political life. But that wasn't the image, right? They thought, uh, you know, the president would be the person who got the most votes and the vice president would get the second most votes. And now that seems, it's totally wild to us that things could be structured that way. Um, and, you know, similarly, I think it's hard to know sitting here what things might look like and, and where we might need to make modifications. Well, Alex, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. And I have to commend you for coming up with, you know, a system that, challenges some of our deeply held beliefs. You know, for a lot of people, democracy is a completely sacred thing and trying to develop a, a, a contrary view is a very difficult thing. And I gather something you've been working on for you know, really most of your professional life. And so wonderful, wonderful that you've done that. And uh, as listeners, uh, we have listeners from all around the world and it has been the year of elections. So I'd be interested to hear whether you are glad that you've got to participate in the democratic process or whether you would have rather rolled the dice and been uh, ruled by your your peers at random. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, Fran, well, it's been wonderful uh, to be here. I will say, you know, the subtitle of the book uh, is Democracy Without Elections. So I'm, I'm very much of the view that this is a kind of democracy and that we should see ourselves as open to having more options while still having them count as democracy. So in the end of the book, I try to make the case for uh, lotocracy as a form of democracy.